One of the most popular questions that we get within the Smithsonian Garden Orchid Collection is, why collect orchids? Well, I like to say orchids are one of the most diverse flowering plant families in the world. They have colonized all continents besides Antarctica, and they have various traits that make them so captivating for not just us, but for their pollinators. Orchids have all the same floral parts. That's what defines them. And they also have different characteristics, such as pollinia, which is a pollen sac, which is a bundle of pollen that is attached to pollinators when pollination occurs. Right here we have a Pathiopetalum species, really beautiful and stunning. The way pollination would occur is an insect, usually a bee, would fly into the bucket. It would fall into the bucket and not be able to find its way out. But the plant has evolved over millions of years to grow a, and to develop a little structure that is like a ladder in the back of the particular flower structure. The insect crawls up that floral structure and when it does come out, it takes the plenty of the pollen sac with it. And then this allows for pollen to be transferred to another flower, the same species, across the way, adding to the variety and diversity of plant genetics for cross-pollination, which is critical within the survival of species, not just orchids. We'll do a little world tour here. We have a Phalaenopsis species from Taiwan. We also have the Cynorchus species, which is from Madagascar. We have this Habenaria medusa, which is from Asia. Really, really stunning. And then we also have this Bobophyllum species. And then we also have this Cycopsis hybrid which is really quite wonderful. And then over here, we have a beautiful hybrid Cattleya, which has a beautiful fragrance. And then down here, we go to the tropical rainforest of South America. This is Stanhopia tigrana, with a beautiful uh, floral fragrance. What makes this plant so interesting is it only lasts three days. And also, it produces an oil that Unglossian bees actually are attracted to and gather. This is used as survival of the fittest because whichever bee has the most fragrance on it is the most likely to have a mate. So as you see, orchids are really diverse. This is just a small sampling of what we have here at the Smithsonian Garden Orchid Collection. But orchids are definitely beautiful in all of their diversity and also the science that comes along with their pollination. So what classifies all orchids that they're orchids? Well, it's all based on the floral structures of the orchid flower. So you have this Phalaenopsis species right here. So all other orchids, even though they look so, 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 so different, they all have the same floral parts. And those are, you have the dorsal stepal, you have your two lateral sepals, and then you have your two petals. And then you also have a labellum or lip which is used for the kind of as a runway for the pollinators. And you also have a fused column, which is this structure right here, where my, where my thumb is. And then under that is an anther cap, which contains the plinia, which the plinia are pollen sacs that contain sacs of pollen. Orchids are found all over the world growing in various ecosystems, from the tundra all the way down to the oceans, in between in the tropical rainforests and the deserts. So orchids have had to adapt and evolve 
depending on the various ecosystems. We have two orchids here that are two various orchids that grow in two different locations. We have the one here, the larger one, with the beautiful tendrilous roots. This is a Vanda species. This grows high up in the canopy in the full sun, so it can get, collect the most nutrients through photosynthesis. What makes this orchid very interesting is the roots. They're again, as you see, they're very thick and they also contain and are very waxy and contain a, a cuticle that's called vellum. That helps with water retention and you can see the various uh, root tip here that's very nice and vibrant green. What I like to do with these particular roots is if I zoom in and I put some water on the roots, you might be able to see the water will actually penetrate the roots and will become green. So they also do contain chlorophyll, which allows this plant also to take advantage and to photosynthesize through the roots. We also have this terrestrial orchid, which is quite different from the Vanda that I just showed you, the epiphyte. You can see the roots are covered with tiny, tiny, tiny hairs. And what this is doing, it's increasing the surface area of the root so that it can absorb more nutrients and keep hydrated within the soil. Notice this does not contain any chlorophyll because it's in the ground. It's growing in the ground, so it has no exposure to light. Here we have some examples. This is um, a Phragmopedium hybrid that we've been growing in the collection for about five years. You can see the new growth is modeled in a green, light green color. This is a plant that we actually were watering with a too low of pH, so too acidic. We were actually watering with the level at 4.4, you can see here on the pH reader. And this is uh, pretty much the same hybrid, but grown with a water pH of six. And you can see the difference in growth, the color and the foliage and the overall health of the plant. So that really determines and shows how important pH is when growing and cultivating. So how do we determine what the pH is of our water sources. So using our rainwater harvesting system, we collect the rainwater. When we collect the rainwater, um, the pH reads a 4.3. That is very acidic and certain plants, most orchids, do not like that. Uh, their ideal pH is 5.5 to 6.5. So through the analysis of tissue and science, Growers have determined that's the proper pH of the most nutrients uptake for the particular orchids that we're trying to grow. So I wanted to illustrate, we have our pH meter here. So you can see it's at a 4.2 right now. This is our rainwater as it, right as it comes out. We have two things. So watering the plants with just a straight water doesn't have any nutrients. So what we wanna do is we wanna add our nutrients. So this is um, our fertilizing solution. Um, it's a particular solution that we use that gives all the uh, available nutrients and proper uh, dosages to the plants when we water. So as you see, we're gonna add this to the solution. So we have particular systems that add the, uh, the nutrient solution to the water. So we mix that up and you can see that the pH is now a five, want a little bit more. So it's at a 5.1. And so that's still too low. And so we wanna get it between the range of 5.5 and 6.5. So we have an additive here that we'll add. And then this will raise the pH, you can see. And so we want it, I'm gonna put it I like to do it at 6.3 if I can get it there. And then there you go. So that's 6.3. So that will bring the water pH to the proper level. So when we water our plants, they'll be getting the right amount of nutrients based on the pH of the water, which is really critical. 
also what we do is we have a solution analysis done at least every six months. We do a sample of our rainwater and then we also do a sample of our fertilized solution to see if our ratios are in check. And so we pretty much have analysis that gets sent out and it gives us a breakdown of all the various nutrients that we have in our water um, and what they're going to our normal ranges, what are we our goal and how can we meet those requirements of the particular plants that we're trying to grow. And so this is a great example of the importance of pH and really cultivating a collection like this, but um, you know, the organ orchids are very susceptible. And you can see right here with the growth versus uh, this particular plant. Let's take a look at these two plants. This plant here is suffering from poor nutrient based on the pH of the water. As you can see, it looks like it has a lack of chlorophyll development due to the lack of nitrogen available to the plant. The basic elements for fertilizing programs are N, nitrogen, P for phosphorus, K for potassium. These elements availabilities are directly linked to various deficiencies that you see in this plant's growth. On the other side, when the plant is getting the correct pH and nutrients, you can see the various green leaves and health and vigor of this particular plant.